Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Reverse Shot Happy Hour. My name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image. And I welcome you to this evening's show. This is the first time we've done a happy hour in about a year. Um, this is something we did dozens of times over 2020 into 2021. Uh, the Reverse Shot Happy Hour started, I think, in May of 2020. And it was our way of hopefully keeping you, but definitely us, entertained, occupied, informed, provoked. Um, and it was our way to kind of continue to, to connect with each other and with you and to talk film. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting to be doing it again after all this time. Um, of course, what happened in between is that the Museum a museum of the Moving Image uh, opened to the public. Uh, we also uh, had our second season of uh, the drive-in. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a great year. It's also been a trying year, I think, for everybody. And we find ourselves in another moment where what necessitated the reverse shot happy hour in the first place um, is unfortunately back with us to some degree. And so though we are still open at the museum and I know that movie theaters are open the way they were not when we started this, it's still a time that's probably safest to do something like this. Um, but regardless of the situation in the world, it's always a time of celebration for a reverse shot to be able to um, announce their top 10. And this is the second year in a row that we're gonna do it in this format. Um, and so with that, we have a lot to get to, obviously, and I'd love to introduce the hosts of the Reverse Shot Happy Hour, the editors and founders of Reverse Shot, Michael Kresge and Jeff Reichert, and contributor and filmmaker, Friha Samara. Oh, how I missed that intro, Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's just so nice. I've heard it in my dreams only. <laughs> I'll see you guys shortly. Inside yes. and on a Zoom again with you all. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, I love seeing you with the brick wall again. It's, it's <laughs> well, I for, for our tens of fans, um, I would like to take a moment to uh, introduce you to my new roommate, the brick wall. I got teased too many times for it seeming like a set of a Brooklyn apartment. Uh, and so I decided to lean into it and bring a big cat into my life. I am taking suggestions for names. Um, yeah. Um, Jeff has also acquired a cat, a slightly yes. less big cat. Big feline here. He's, he's alive and he doesn't want to be on the Zoom tonight, it doesn't seem. But if he comes out, I'll bring him up here. He's sassy and hefty and his name is Rufus. That's disappointing. I wanted to see him. I mean, He'll I guess probably I appear and show you his thick bottom <laughs> right oh. when, right before number one. Who can say? Let's see. If people Maybe would like back. to see. Lucy, Lucy's interest right now. That's Rufus. That's Rufus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what people came for, us to yeah. talk about our animals. Our pets. Um, no. People well, now that here. we're all like relatively socially isolated, uh, it feels nice to see your faces again. It's wonderful to see you. Um, very excited for this countdown. Uh, we've been editing Reverse Shot since 2003, though it's been a publication of Museum of the Moving Image since 2014. So in that time, we've had quite a lot of top tens. Mm -hmm. We've always stuck to 10. We don't do this yeah, 20, none of the 20 business. 5, 50 bullshit. No. Either you no, make it to the 10 or you don't. It gets <laughs> it's not, when you get past it's just sloppy business. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wish we had 20. I know that's a lot. It's a lot of movies. Um, but this was, a, I mean, these kinds of sweeping statements of good and bad about an entire year are maybe relatively meaningless. But somewhere deep in my heart, I have this sense that like this was a good year for movies. And I also think our writers pool um, has such a diversity of taste that there are films that I know um, I was sad not to see mentioned. So maybe we can take a beat to, you know, how, maybe it's a little bit of a tease about what is on the list, but I'm curious what, um, what are like some honorable mentions for you? Well, I think I'm, I, I do think it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, so I am going to reserve my comments about that for later. But I mean, I guess I could choose, if I could choose something that um, I know is going to come back in the conversation later, and I guess it's not too much of a spoiler that it didn't make it, is Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. It's not gonna be on the top 10. Sorry to spoil that for folks, but it's great. And we are going to talk about it later in the show. 
Should we talk about Belfast right now? Oh, <laughs> Belfast had no chance. I did see Barb and Belfast. Star on a couple of critics lists and I was pleased because I think it's genuinely good. And I will reveal that one of my handful of where we're in a time when it's okay to the mo- go to the movies, movie experiences was a birthday <laughs> Barb and Star uh, f- like fr- friend trip to the movies. And I wasn't sure it would hold up to a second viewing and it really did. I would say it gets better and better. It's like Power <laughs> of the Dog. It's better and better. Excellent. Excellent. And, and much like Power of the Dog, excellently cast. Some roles, very, a very expected good fit. Some roles, uh, beautiful surprise. I actually think those two films, Power of the Dog and Barbara Star, are actually quite similar in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's about desire and Americana. Mm-hmm, exactly. <laughs> and regional Ameri- specific regional Americanas. I feel bad getting too far into this without some of our very special guests, however, especially because one of these guests had Barb and Star very high on their list. Um, So anyway, I would like to introduce our three panelists tonight who will help us go over and dissect all of our choices for the best movies of the year. So um, let's introduce three fantastic reverse shot contributors. Juan Barkeen, who's a freelance writer and programmer for the queer film series, Flaming Classics. I always wanna say Flaming Creatures, Flaming, Cla- Flaming Classics. <laughs> um, Chloe Lazat. Here's the Flaming Creatures. Well, uh, Chloe Lazat, who is a, a writer and contributing editor for Le Cinema Club and Beatrice Chris Loiza, who's a freelance critic and the associate editor at the Criterion Collection. So it is always wonderful to see you. I'm so happy you're here. It just makes tonight so much sweeter. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for waiting for that. (laughs) There's always that creepy dead space in in his room. I was just like, I don't want to be the first one to say it, but you know, I will. And also Barb and Star is the best. So yeah. <laughs> Have you been able to see it in a theater with an audience? Wait, oh no, I think I cut out. How does oh, this manage to always happen to me? <laughs> You're overwhelmed by your love of Barb and Star? <laughs> we, we can hear and see you, which is all that Yeah. Matters. Um, so do we want to just get started at six, since it's 10 past six, we should start. Sure. Shall I, um, shall I share the slideshow? Yeah. Sure. Jeff, I, Jeff made art to. I just wanted to say it. at the outset that, um, first of all, we're going to be posting the entire article tomorrow on reverse shot, and that's going to have the full capsules, new, new pieces written, um, by reverse shot writers, including the, um, three guests we have tonight. And also just very, very briefly how the poll works is that we pull all the major contributors for the magazine over the past year. And, you know, the top, you know, when they have 10, the top one gets the most points, so and so and so. And that's how we arrive at the uh, final result, just so people know how that works. It's sort of obvious, but maybe not to everybody. Okay, so let's uh, let's see if this will work. Okay, so good old Google Docs. Right. <laughs> Should we see Love a black <laughs> screen? Is it working? Okay. Okay, let's start it. Start at number ten. El Planeta, directed by Amalia Ullman. Um, a, a terrific movie, a really, really wonderful debut by Amalia Ullman, um, who's an Argentinian filmmaker. This film takes place in Spain. Um, it's, I think it's probably the shortest film in the top 10, um, which is, I think, saying something considering the length of some of the other films. Um, it's also just um, a remarkable portrait of this contemporary moment, which I think a lot of films aren't necessarily getting at because they were made at earlier moments or they, they're not necessarily as keyed into now. Um, this is a really movie about economic crisis and it does this in a really funny way in this mother-daughter relationship. I do feel I should probably pass this along to first Chloe because Chloe wrote a pretty great in-depth piece about Amalia Ullman and specifically a lot of her um, 
her multimedia work before she made her first feature. So if you don't mind telling people a little more about El Planeta, because they might not know about it. Sure, yeah. Well, just to start, um, what a great surprise to start the top 10. I totally didn't expect this to place. And I was fully prepared to talk about this as my like snub or whatever. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, Amalia Ullman, um, prior to this, her feature debut, um, she was a pretty prolific um, performance artist, particularly on Instagram. She did a lot of pieces where, um, sorry, there's a siren going by, that's Brooklyn living for you. Um, You're just excited. She, yeah, <laughs> um, she did one piece where she was um, in extended character as an influencer on Instagram and talking about not only um, just like uh, inhabiting that mindset and doing character work, but also like um, capital and class and in this very kind of like using the form really well and knowledgeably to, um, and, and with a lot of comedy too. Um, but like the, that type of uh, <clears throat> performance um, might come as a surprise to people who are particularly seeing El Planeta for the first time, which is more of a straightforward seeming sort of um, kind of 90 minute Ugh, dramedy, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but like sort of in this like black and white Jim Jarmusch type of mood with some humor inflected by like silent cinema. There's a lot um, going on, but fundamentally at its heart, it's a story of um, um, Amalia's character and um, her, her mother played by her real life mother on the verge of eviction from an apartment in uh, Spain. And it gets it kind of, uh, yeah, like it's a, it's a very contemporary story about um, again, class and capital, but um, with a really beautiful kind of emotional core that's both funny and moving all at once. So yeah, highly recommend seeking it out if you can. Yeah, it's really terrific. Beatrice, I know it was also a movie that was on your top 10 and I have inside knowledge of everybody's top 10s, which is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love this. Um, I don't know, I, I found it to be such like a real and like uncondescending portrait of poverty that you know, it's also calling attention to like the history and economic realities of a place in a way that's like not schematic and on the nose, which is just so rare these days. Like things are usually just like spelled out when like we're dealing with these like tough social issues. Um, and like, obviously it's also hilarious. Like I always think about the beginning, um, you know, we see this wallpaper backdrop of like a conquistador era vessel that's like obviously you know kind of hearkening to like the glory days of the Spanish empire when like the, that reality today or when the reality today is that like you know obviously Spain is in these like dire straits economically and you know this idea of Spain being like in, important and powerful and wealthy it's pretty much nostalgically in a way that's ridiculous and that parallels this relationship um, between mother and daughter who don't entirely accept the fact that they're in no place to be super glamorous and yet they do. Um, so I don't know, it, it makes fun of all of this and it's super charming, but you know, there's also a dignity to it all that I find super refreshing. Mm, yeah, that's a great point about the dignity. I, I love the way that um, you just kind of incrementally get the sense of their economic desperation and despair, right? It's, it's that's, and that's, you don't get that, op certainly don't get that in American cinema, right? Where you're just dropped into a world with people who are living their day-to-day -day lives and doing these day-to-day -day things. And then you gradually realize just how serious this situation is. And you're laughing the whole time that you're watching. Right, they just sort of drop hints at it. Like, like you know, at one point they're watching a video on the laptop and then, the computer runs out of battery and they're like, oh, well, I guess I'll charge the laptop at like the library later because we don't have electricity, like shrug. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a movie that shrugs until it doesn't. I'll, I'll put it that <laughs> way. Um, so that's great. We should, we should uh, move on to the next one. I'm very excited that that made it. Um, so so what's, it gonna be? what's it gonna be? Number nine, what do we see when we look at the sky by Alexander Koberice? And I think, um, I know Eric, this was uh, high on your priority list. And I wonder if you will gift us with some sure. thoughts about- although, although I was recently trying to write um, for the 
tomorrow's top 10 about this and, and, and couldn't get past the idea that it's actually a really, really hard film to accurately write about. Because it's a sort of thing where um, the, the elements that might be in play or the words that might come to mind as you reach for a way of describing it kind of deserve it um, and, and kind of diminish what it is. To me, it's like just this space that you enter into. Um, and it's like such a sort of casually masterful way of making movies where kind of everything is deliberate and everything is forethought um, and everything is kind of open-ended and generous at the same time. Like it's just, um, it, is, uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a space that you enter into and sort of get taken. Like I remember feeling that when I was, as I was watching this, cause it was in Berlin, virtual Berlin last year. And uh, within like, you know, seven, eight minutes, I realized that I was being just kind of just taken away. Like I was already just kind of just being taken somewhere else and I was giving myself over to it. And really a few experiences mean more to me in film than being able to just kind of just give yourself over to whatever a filmmaker is doing. Um, and to not resist it and to just sort of let yourself go rather than trying to figure out what it's doing, trying to figure out how it relates to something else I've seen. It just became something entirely fresh. Um, and, uh, and I feel that way about both Alexander Kubitz's uh, films. And, I, you know, he's, he certainly takes his time. He has a, you know, he, he's, not a, he's not a sort of epic maker, but he definitely takes his time. But I think that's kind of part of, part of you know, you have to kind of settle into it in order to be really swept away by it. Um, so um, it's a gorgeous film. I also really appreciated this film, but will confess that I had not seen it before the reverse shot voting. I watched it in preparation for our conversation today and I knew that it was high on your list. I think I watched it yesterday and um, I had the opposite experience with a long time for the film to resonate for me. And I will even admit that I was like, because of Eric, I'm watching this oh, because of me. film and i'm just like not exactly sure where we're going I, you know i think that the filmmaking is very um intentional and distinctive it wasn't like a, a lack of skill um I, I i just i couldn't quite catch on to it and then there was a moment which to me just sort of um clarified all of the threads that were working for me and from that moment on i was just completely uh charmed and taken um and it's this it's i don't think it's a, like a narrative spoiler so i'm i'm willing to share this um it's a moment where you see a very wide shot and a family is sort of gathered around a picnic table and uh, the, you know, it's nothing but greenery behind them. And there's a zoom in that happens and it just goes to a, a seemingly random spot in the trees. I was very moved by this idea of having our attention drawn to the other, you know, other living creatures bearing witness to a moment. This, it was just such a, sweet and subtle and masterful shift in perspective um, that made me like trust and understand a lot of the other choices that are made in the film that don't make it feel like these grand like overly grandiose statements to bring in you know conversation about the environment and about uh, the violence of our time um, I think it's it's just m much deeper than it appears on the surface Jeff are you ready to take us to number eight Time for number eight. Are you ready for number eight? I'll try to be. Okay, hold on. It's coming. Wait a minute. Does he sound effect? Hold on. Oh, there it is. Wheel <laughs> of Fortune and Fantasy. Um, this might not be the last Hamaguchi movie on the list. Just saying. Um, <laughs> I'm sure zero people would be surprised to hear that. Um, but this is my favorite Hamaguchi movie of the year by far. Um, absolutely adored this movie. Um, but I'm going to pass this one along to Juan because I know that you are a fan and you have written about it. There we go, okay. Um, yeah, I, I love Wheel of Fortune Fantasy. I think I've seen it four times now and I'm pretty positive I've like either cried or wept each time <laughs> um I just like I, I mean I I saw it I think maybe a random night at like one in the morning and each short was just so like perfectly conceived and I feel like a lot of people consider it kind of minor as opposed to drive my car just because it's like these little short bursts and it's each one is just so lovely and so intimate and it really puts you into these characters minds in a way that like 
I don't know. Like, I just, I haven't seen that often in movies. <laughs> um, and I just love all the performances too. It's just so, it's, it's so lovely. Like lovely is the only word I can keep <laughs> bringing up for it. It's, it's so, and it's so, it's so richly drawn. And the thing that I, when I, when I first started watching it and the first story happens, and again, I'm not going to give away each one has each one has like a little twist to it right so there there are these kind they're kind i'm not gonna say they're oh henry ish but you know there's a little a little twist to each one but after the first one i thought oh, okay so this is hamaguchi doing um like doing hong sang su kind of like it felt like that what was happening with the characters and then as it developed i i realized he was doing something completely different by the time of the, the third story comes around which is completely masterful I was also just um, nearly in tears. It's just that, that that third story gets at, which is what you're looking at yeah. right now, the, the two uh, women in this image, um, that really gets at something kind of unspeakable about or un indescribable about human relations. Yeah, it's just a really beautiful film about connections. And I think somebody also said this online and I'm trying to remember who it is, but I can't, but just like implying that like Hamaguchi basically made like shoujo slice of life movies as live action. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's exactly why I love him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, I love that, that example. <laughs> you, also, um, you made a great point um, in the piece that's going up tomorrow when we all reveal our writing um, just about how this movie deals with change, right. About people dealing with change and um, each one shows that, you know, depending on what is thrown our way, um, we can either rise to the challenge or we can fail. <laughs> and I think that the movie shows examples of both. Yeah. Um, great cool. film. Was there anyone else who wanted to chime in about Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy? It's a multifaceted film. I know we had some other fans. It's, it's also my favorite of the, the Hamaguchi films. It sneaks up on you and then it does it, but it does it three times. It's my favorite as well, um, as much because I think it is the superior film, but also because I kind of have some issues with the other one, but <laughs> that's for a later, a later talk. You're not the only one. I, I think I like, I felt that I took away some thoughts about Hamaguchi as a director and things that he does across both um, films. And it's like to, to have put out both of these films in the same year is totally mind blowing to me as a filmmaker, um, regardless of which is your favorite or, or you know, if you think one might be a little bit lacking. But the, the, a big takeaway for me was like thinking about films that are like do um, a, a basis in conversation and, and talk like extremely well. And it's not to say that it's otherwise lacking um, visually. There's so much just in terms of like presence on screen and the performances in both of the films and uh, you know, very intentional color palette and all of, all of these very purposeful elements. But it's rare to see a film, I think with so much talking that also takes talking as its subject matter frequently and like our inability to connect the words that were said in the past, um, how it stays with you when you were unable to speak. And I think that that um, sort of like self-reflexiveness felt very profound to me and particularly in these three little gems. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I really like how the conversations are as important for what's being said, but also what's being lied about, what's being withheld. And, you know, to me, it, it is a more natural extension of, of Hamaguchi's entrance, interest in um, like performance and rehearsal than like the more, you know, explicit ways he plays on that in his other films. Absolutely. Um, just thrilling stuff. Okay, so to, in the, in, I, I could talk about this forever, but to, you know, to keep things moving, um, let's move on to number seven, which is a particular favorite of mine, bad luck banging or loony porn, which, I, which I've never said out loud. I, I, well, <laughs> I don't think I have. One of the all-time greatest titles. Yeah. So um, fun to say and even think about. It is, um, this was actually my number one movie of the year. Um, so I'm happy that it's here, though I could I could have seen it higher. Um, this is a Romanian filmmaker, Radu Jude, and th this was the first thing I'd ever seen by him, despite being a fan of so many of the other Romanian filmmakers. This is a truly singular work. Um, it is as 
kind of insane as the title would let you think, but not in a way that you might think. It's an extremely political movie. It's an extremely historically damning movie, but it's also about the moment. Um, it's separated into three sections, each one radically different than the, than the others. Um, and I would say each one of those sections is trying to piss off the audience. I think each one of those sections is trying to make someone in the audience leave. And I think that not a lot of movies these days are doing that. It actually starts with literal pornography in the beginning. So if you don't stick around, if you don't wanna stick around after uh, seeing that in the first you know, two minutes of the movie, then you have the exit. Um, but this is a movie that is uh, in, in a very, very broad outline. It's about a school teacher, an elementary school teacher who has um, a, a sex tape that she made with her husband and a consensual sex tape has been leaked on the internet accidentally by her husband and she is forced to run this gauntlet um, of self-defense and um, she's sort of like put on trial to a certain extent by um, parents and teachers in her community. That is such a, like a wildly um, uh, imperfect way of describing a film that goes in all kinds of directions. And like we were saying, the third chapter of Wheel of uh, Fortune and Fantasy, it's funny that we have three triptychs right next to each other. Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy, the third section is sort of like the movie of the year. Someone was saying, I feel like the second section of Bad Luck Banging or Looney Porn is the movie of the year. Um, though I should pass this along so, so I don't talk about it exclusively. I'm gonna pass along to Chloe because Chloe, I know, is a, also a huge fan of this and is, has also written um, something for the top 10 on this movie. Yeah, I mean, this was something while writing about it where I was like, is this not only the best movie of the year, but one of the best movies ever? And possibly. <laughs> um, I really loved it. Um, and I mean, to speak to what you were saying about it, trying to piss off the audience, um, it's cool because um, it's constantly in dialogue with what it means to be like a confrontational image. Like you start with this out of context sex tape and you're watching it and it's like explicit, but also like embarrassing and weird. And it's like, it's really like, you know, um, uh, it's a strong statement, opening statement to start your movie with that. And then as it progresses, it's like, um, you kind of don't know where the narrative is going. Like you're kind of going on errands with the main character and the camera will like drift around at these like garish billboards. And it's like, what is what is this trying to communicate to me? And it's just kind of like, then you get to this middle section, which is like a historical um, kind of accounting of political violence in Eastern Europe and stuff. And then it's it, it starts to more clearly engage with um, kind of histories of violence that we like, uh, cover up or choose not to face and images we choose not to face or things that we deem kind of like easy to demonize or villainize in the context of like misogyny and kind of sexually explicit images. So, and I thought that was pretty amazing to put uh, not only into like an experimental narrative film, but into a comedy. It's really funny. Again, another funny movie. And there were a lot of great comedies this year actually. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's amazing and defies description. So check it out when you can. <laughs> Absolutely. Freeha, was there something you'd wanted to say about this one? I know you're also a fan. Yes, but I think that you covered it really well. And I'm excited <laughs> yeah, I mean, to hear now perfect. number six. <laughs> I think, I that's, think that's an accomplishment. I, I think you're uh, boldly positing it one of the, just like a, uh, one of the best movies you've ever seen. And I appreciate that because I think that, um, I don't know. I don't know that it's always been, um, appreciated at the level of craft <laughs> and storytelling and the sort of depth of theme that you're referring to. And I, yeah, I think I would uh, e easily concur with you both. It's a movie about, it's a movie about violence and it's a movie about misogyny and it's sexism and, and all the things that movies want to be about. It just does it in a more radical, interesting way than any of the other movies. And, and that those qualities like begin in ways that are deemed small and experiences that are considered like an individual person's problem when really we know that it's an indicator of like much, as Chloe said, a much um, uh, more systemic uh, culture of violence. Mm -hmm. And it does sound such a smart and dare I say entertaining way. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably has the best conclusion of the year. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, well, is that the best conclusion of the year, Jeff? It's <laughs> great, but the last two to three minutes are really great. <laughs> yes, yeah, stick with it, people. All right. Okay, moving on. Three, huh? Ooh, West Side Story by West Side Gilbert. Story. One for one to see big if you can. Um, I think it would be great to start with Juan on West Side Story. I know this was um, time for you. I've been told yeah. by the, uh, the list uh, editing gods. I sincerely did not expect this to be in the top, but I'm actually really thrilled. <laughs> um, holy shit. Uh, so I'm going to make a confession. I've actually sort of never liked West Side Story all that much. Um, I've liked the music, obviously. Um, but I always had a weird thing against like all of the brown face in it. Um, just, not, I mean. Not that weird. It's just a very Not that weird. Thing. It's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've just like, I don't know. Like, I, I like it. It's just a very stagey movie. It's fine. But then I watched this one and I did not want to like it. I truly resisted it. And the second viewing really, really swept me away. And I think it's got such a, such a wonderful cast. Um, I think Tony Kushner's updates to the script. I know a lot of people think they're unnecessary. I actually, I truly do think that all of the updates to the Spanish to like cultural specificity, even though it's not necessarily that specific, um which like much like in the heights everything's kind of just broad in general like latinx representation but like it's it feels lived in and the characters actually feel like human beings instead of people who are voicing weird white male complaints about puerto ricans through puerto rican characters um <laughs> and it's ah, just spielberg's direction is like it's beautiful, 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 beautiful. I I still can't stop thinking it's a, such a simple shot, but it's just like the puddle shot in Maria is so, so goddamn beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I just love it. I know it's like Michael and I were talking about it through like emails a million times. <laughs> well, it just it goes to show how bad it's gotten for us with movie musicals over the past few years that yeah. like, you know, like think about what we have been served up and then this thing comes along and it is just perfect and bodies are moving in space and it just all makes sense. The cuts work. It's just making smart choices. I was totally blown away. I mean, I, I was, you know, caught me amongst, also amongst the skeptical before this. I was like, really, really Steve, this is where we're going at age 75, you're gonna do West Side Story. Okay, but it's great. Well, and, and, and I wanted to say, um, by the way, I tried to share, uh, Juan wrote a really exceptional article uh, in Reverse Shot about West Side Story, and I wanted to share it, but it's not, letting me, it's not letting me put the link in. So people look for Juan's article on West Side Story. Um, and I've written about it for tomorrow's top 10, and, and it, it probably, it shouldn't be a surprise that I loved it as much as I do because I'm a huge musical fan who is also a huge Spielberg fan, but I'm also not a huge West Side Story fan. So this was, it always just, it was, there was something about it that even as a kid, I remember thinking like, this is all wrong. Like the casting is wrong. Like, you know, why is Natalie Wood in brown face? Why is she dubbed? Why does nothing work? Um, so it all felt <laughs> very artificial. <laughs> And, and then it was really interesting to see, you know, so many people say, well, how could you possibly improve upon the original classic? And I thought, well, but it's Steven Spielberg. He's clearly a better filmmaker than Robert Wise. Um, who I've, and I've liked many Robert Wise films, but I mean, was there really that much doubt? And um, the only thing I, more to say about it is that, you know, I, 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 I actually like started to resent Spielberg after watching this for allowing us to go through decades of shitty movie musicals. He should have been making them all along. <laughs> <laughs> These, the movie musicals that we've had to, to to watch for the past 30, 40 years are just so execrable. And to for him to come along and just say like, hey, look what I can do. You didn't really, like the prom? Really piss me off. <laughs> like, oh which, God, the prom. I forgot it existed. I'm sorry. And, so, and then I cackled like a witch afterwards. <laughs> I just like, what? Like, no, I can't, I can't get started on Netflix musicals because it'll just go down a bad rabbit hole of like the prom and tick tick garbage um but anyway that's an embarrassment, <laughs> that's an, that was an embarrassment. 
Um, but yeah, every everything about this, the way the way that it's the way that bodies actually move in space, the way that dance sequences are cut, the way duets are filmed. I mean, he just intrinsically, intuitively gets it in a way that no other filmmaker has in a very long time. So it was very exciting. Okay, I think it's time for number five. Who's gonna say it? Is Michael saying this one or is no, It's your turn. It's my turn. Oh, great, okay. Ready. What's it gonna be? Oh, it's this one. Whoa, it's coming on really weirdly. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh no! Oh. Oh, God, sorry. Big reveal. Ah, ah, sorry, number Nobody five. Was you didn't see number four. <laughs> okay. Um, so, anyway, say it, Jeff. You screwed it up. Then, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was the computer. <laughs> okay. So, Annette by Leos Carax. Here might this might be a divisive one. Um, but I think that we should start with Beatrice on this one because she's written about it for tomorrow. And I think it was, was it your number one movie of the year? Yes, it was. <laughs> I feel like I've talked about how much I love it like a billion times. So I'm just like repeating myself at this point. Um, but yes, it was my number one movie of the year. And um, I mean, I don't even know how to start. I mean, <laughs> like I, I sort of get how some people might feel like it's sort of an estranging, like super ironic and like cynical, which like I totally understand, but like, you know, and I've seen it a number of times, but like, I, I take it very earnestly. Like this is to me very much like a fairy tale, a romantic fantasy that, you know, from the get go, it announces that we're, you know, immersing ourselves in and that we have to like suspend, you know, all of our notions of reality. And you know, in general, I, I do consider myself kind of a sucker for for films that are are very consciously, um, you know, grappling with the kind of desire and investment that plays out in our relationship to like fantasy and fiction, and that tries to like manifest that. And in this case, it does it in a very like spectacular and just like pleasurable way for me. And um, also, I do just love sparks. <laughs> so that was a, a big contribution for why I liked it so much. That and, and Adam Driver and like, you know, the choice to make Baby Annette a wooden puppet was like an incredibly moving thing to me. You know, this need to take seriously this like obviously fraudulent thing that's like a literal prop and like you know, invest in your yourself into it emotionally and take seriously the journey of this thing, you know, I just found incredibly moving and like, obviously, I mean, not to spoil, but like the ending I found to be, you know, just one of the most like striking endings of the year. Um, so, I mean, it's all very rambly, but, but I do love this film a lot. <laughs> I think, I think the ending is definitely what tips you off or tips me off to how seriously to take it all. You know, I don't, I don't, you can't get to that spot and think that we've been watching is somehow kind of some game or some ironic play. Um, it just seems like incredibly raw, honest, kind of, you know, self-punishing place to go to for an artist. Um, and so I think that his way of getting there is unconventional and not easy to take a lot of the time. Like I love Leo's Carrick's films, but I don't always love watching them, which is not something I hold against them at all. I actually, uh, I, I, I'm up for the challenge. And I do think this is, the, this is a film that gets to that spot at the end that actually just kind of justifies every choice for me. Yeah. <laughs> It's a movie I'm still wrestling with, though I did I did like it. Um, I I had that constant back and forth battle in my mind. Is this a joke? Is this not a joke? Is this a joke? It's not a joke. And then I think I do agree with you. I think it ends on a quite poignant and beautiful note. And I do think that everything everything with the with the puppet with the with the baby in that is is brilliantly conceived and executed. Okay, moving on to number four. What could it be? Rise. <laughs> Power of the Dog by Jane Campion. What's this doing here? Um, wow. So um, 
I I think I think you should start talking about this one, Jeff. Was this your was this your number one? No, number two. This was my number two. It would have been my number one, except for another movie that came along, which shall remain nameless for at least a little while longer. But um, gosh, I I saw this movie in Yellow Springs, Ohio, went in a matinee, and just kind of you know, it's not that I didn't have um, decently outsized expectations for a new Jane Campion movie, but I just thought, well, what what will this be? And I didn't know very much about it at all. And I just almost immediately was sort of, and and it, it was a similar experience in some ways to watching West Side Story when all of a sudden you're in the grip of a filmmaker that is so confident and in, so in control with the camera. It's such a relief almost. I felt within a, a few shots, I was just felt like this is going to be something. This is going to take me to something. This is going to build in certain ways. This is going to introduce ideas in smart ways. And it's going to be completely engaging throughout. I actually almost immediately upon it starting, started thinking about how no, how bad films like Nomadland are, both in how they film landscape in the West, but also how they just tell story in a way. I mean, this is so confident and so assured, and it's there's there's so much to spin over at the end of it. I mean, I know people have come out of it. And there's been Twitter threads about like well, what actually happens at the end of the movie, and I think that's really exciting. I mean, to, for people to leave a you know a fairly in some way straightforward narrative experience and to be a little confused about all the different particulars, I think that's that's a great place to be. And I'll just add that I saw this movie once, uh, the first time um, many months ago, um, you know, before well, before it was released. And, um, and then I saw it again this past week and uh, for the first time on the, on the big screen. And it was, an, it was an incredible experience. And just, I, I would encourage anyone, whether you loved it or thought it was just okay, or perhaps didn't like it, to watch it a second time to truly admire the skill, the efficiency with which she tells this story. There is no wasted moment here. It is taut, it is tight, it is brilliant. Um, I, 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 was, I, I, was in, I was really blown away by the performances, especially the second time. There's a lot going on here. It's, um, this, is a, this is a queer movie. This is, a, oh, this so is cool. like, a, this is like an, an intrinsically, perfectly queer film. Um, probably the, the best of the year in that way. And, uh, you know, I still don't want to give too much away. I'm sure there are some people who haven't really seen it. And so I don't want to say why that is, but this is a movie about um, the experience of being an outsider in all the ways that that word can be used. Mm -hmm. Beautifully made. Also, I mean, what a brilliant use of kind of a chaptering structure. In the, <laughs> really in another film on the list that is broken into pieces, but a way that is divided up into sections, the way those sections function differently within the context of a movie that is a very seamless whole. It's just, it's a, it's a lot. It's, it's I've, I fully expected it to be my best film of the year. And it came close. So should I the power of the dog lovers on. here? Eric's like, enough already about this one. No, no, I, I love this film. I'm like, similar to what Jeff said about watching somebody be in the hands of a filmmaker like this, I just, you know, for a canonized filmmaker, you forget how strange Jane Campion is as a director. Right. Yeah. Just unique, makes her own choices. Like she just makes choices that nobody else would make. Mm -hmm. And and it's just thrilling to kind of be in, the, in her presence again. Okay. Number three, Freya, are you calling this one out? Yeah. Boom. Very, very pleased to uh, call out The Souvenir Part Two by Joanna Hogg. Um, who should start? Um, Beatrice, would you start us off? There's so much to say. Sure. Um, so this was on my top 10, obviously, but, um, but I, I can't say that it's like my favorite Joanna Hogg film. Mm -hmm. um, however, I, I was very thrilled by the fact that, you know, this is very clearly a Joanna Hogg movie. And by that, I mean, you know, the class tensions, you know, the way she's bringing to life her characters' insecurities and anxieties within like very beautifully constructed interiors, the way she works with depth of field, like all these things that are very like quintessentially Hogsian. Um, and yet I found that she's very much like delving into new territory here. You know, there's like a full circle quality to it in that it um, harkens very clearly to her like first student film, which is like sort of a pop musical starring Tilda Swinton. And 
you know, in general, she does love movie musicals and that sort of popular aesthetic. Um, and yet she's not done that in like a feature film of hers yet. Um, so I don't know, I just found this like so refreshingly like joyous, the use of needle drops, the like buoyancy of it, um, while also, um, you know, very acutely capturing Julie's like emotional turmoil, the way that she's healing and then like finding her independence um, in a way that, that isn't heavy handed in a way that, that's um, like complex and intricate without um, feeling on the nose. So, so yeah, I mean, this is definitely not, not my favorite Joanna Hogg movie, but I say this while acknowledging the fact that it also very much opens up her work in, in very exciting ways. Uh, you're getting a lot of asks about what is your favorite Joanna Hogg movie. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm just also curious. So I yeah, to... no, pro I mean, I really like, like all of her early stuff, but my favorite yeah. is probably Archipelago. Yeah. Um, and maybe Exhibition next, because it's just so freaking weird. <laughs> yeah, I agree that there's um, something, the, the like things that are a little rougher about those films um, have an appeal that this perhaps, it is like, it does feel the most constructed of her work. And um, similarly with what do we see when we look at the sky, it's not at all that it took me a moment to uh, appreciate the work, but it took a moment for me to um, be emotionally affected by it. Um, and I think sometimes that like slow burn, I really appreciate. And I, I really appreciate when people use a kind of like a heightened artifice as filmmakers to bring you closer to emotional experience. And I thought mm -hmm. that that was beautifully done. And I have to say, although I know it's like um, revealing some bias because as a lady filmmaker, I uh, am certainly one of the key demographics for this film, but I have, I can't remember seeing a more painfully realistic depiction of what it feels like to be that young woman in the room and the like flow of conversation around you, the feedback about the work that you're doing, this like just this long painful thread was um, like it, 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 it touched something deep that I didn't want to think about um, and does it well. And I think actually connects in a meaningful way with the other elements that are being played with. So it didn't feel to me that just she's like throwing something on top of this, but that that idea of like subjectivity and kind of like reconnecting with a kind of vision was bold. It was a really bold turn from what we saw in Souvenir One. There, I mean, I think, you know, when, when a film is really beloved and critically acclaimed and you have a sequel that's so different in approach, um, you might lose some people along the way. And I think the risk was really worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think part of why I feel maybe a little distant from this movie is because like, I don't necessarily like Julie, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's also the triumph of the film and that she's not like super brilliant or like super lovable. She just kind of is so... I don't know, like that's, it, I have complex feelings towards that, that, but I think it's actually like a positive aspect of the film. Yeah, and she's also, and that's in keeping so much with Joanna Hogg's films where people, mm -hmm. the, the things that are frustrating about her characters are that they often can't articulate what they're feeling or they don't see what's right in front of them and it can drive you insane as a viewer. And it's always been interesting to hear people say like, oh, I can't really connect to that character. Or, I don't really like that character. I, it drove mm -hmm. me crazy that she didn't say this or didn't notice this. It's, that's, that seems like the point of so many of her movies. I thought this was, I thought this was superb. I thought this movie was just almost scene for scene magical. I absolutely loved it. I, I also, I just wanted to give Chloe a chance because I also <laughs> just wanted to say that Chloe wrote a very brilliant um, review of this for a shot. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm just like trying to figure out what I would say in a sentence about this. Um, because this is one of the two movies on this list um, that I got like totally inarticulate and emotional about as I watched it. The other one we passed in it. Um, but this, um, I mean, what you were saying about um, the frustration of not like not the characters not being able to articulate kind of what's in front of them, like the way that that is like explicitly part of the film is so well done here. And like, I think it's just kind of, um, I mean, it, it's really amazing in how it gets at like everything that is going on in this character's life and has empathy toward kind of all the characters around her uh, very quietly uh, um, is really tremendous and outstanding. And um, 
yeah, um, to deepen so much and in such surprising ways and build on the first one um, was really a stellar. And it might be my favorite of her films. I'm not sure, but I like I like them all for the record. But yeah, really great. Cool, great. All right, so off the list. Where is Mike Mills's "Come On, Come On" going to land? <laughs> <laughs> it has its fans they're out there somewhere they're not in this room they're not in this room. well i shouldn't speak for everybody but um, certainly not in this room we can talk about it later uh, um all right number two uh oh it's coming uh oh no no <laughs> no my computer froze all right anyway <laughs> oh, at really least stressful Oh. Okay. Well, well, you know, people are taking bets on this via text and in the chat right now. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, people gonna... who are not fans of suspense, you've come to the right top 10. Um, well, number two, I don't know what number one could possibly be, but number two is Drive My Car, the, the other Hamaguchi film. The other Hamaguchi film, as I call it, um, other. which is a film that I um, like fine but i would love to pass it off to somebody who wow. loves it and i think i don't know maybe eric should start this one sure i just man, i don't like these cinephile traps that we get in at the end of the year where we're like comparing films to each other and i like that one more than the other i hate this shit um but i get love out of here heinz get out of here eric, i love you know, driving it's hamaguchi's fault he made two. Oh, yeah but what would you grade it Eric. I know I would grade it uh, yeah. Yeah, I would grade <laughs> on the pitchfork scale. We um, I don't know. What can I say? I don't know. I, 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 I you know, it, this and uh, this and uh, what I see, look at this guy are definitely my two favorite, you know, uh, narrative experiences of the year um, in terms of, again, giving myself over to something. Um, I, yeah, I just love every second of this film. I love the performances. I love what it takes the time to get to. Um, I, I love the kind of, you know, uh, title, com title card coming in 40 minutes in, um, it's, I'm an easy target for that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I just, I think he has probably one of the most unique approaches to time in, in film. And, uh, and I think that, uh, it's, again, it's really hard to just tell somebody that this is not actually a grind whatsoever, that it's an absolute pleasure to watch. Mm -hmm. Um, but he really does make that work at three hours. Yeah, I think it has to be three hours to work because I was thinking about I just it's so writerly and it's so tight in a writerly way that I think would be really irritating if it was 100 minutes but stretched out over three hours and really kind of drilled in on um I, I do the, you know I do you know not to do the cinephile thing but I prefer Wheel of Fortune to Fantasy but this really kind of kind of took me on a ride as they say come on Wow, he oh, yeah. Oh, we're all I mean, rolling our eyes. Uh, <laughs> I think that's not to you know. I like both, but um, uh, I think this one edges out Wheel of Fortune a little bit for me, um, partially just because like I saw it before I saw Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy, but it was also just like such an amazing kind of treat to sink back into kind of uh, the way that Hamaguchi like. Uh, writes characters and kind of directs conversations. And I loved having kind of the space to kind of uh, stay with these people and kind of watch um, how things developed in surprising ways. But also um, I really liked kind of watching him go in depth with um, uh, theater and performance a little bit more explicitly. I think that expansive canvas was really well done. And, you know, I mean, this is a film where like, you could do a film about in it and that's pretty incredible um but yeah i, I love drive my car i just yeah i i actually think this is a, it's a it's a it's a beautifully made movie it held my attention so dramatically for three hours it's beautifully structured and acted um i didn't mean to come off flippant, flippant about it if i have any reservation um about it i think it's it's for me it's in the last half hour i i i um you know without going into specifics i i don't think that it pays off all the things that it that it um, so expertly um, raises, and I thought there was something a little pat or easy about the way that where it goes. I'll put it that way. But, I agree um, with you, Michael. Yeah. yeah, 
it's weird because it's like simultaneously, I think it contains like one of the most beautiful scenes he's ever filmed, which for me is like the the dinner he has with like the, mm. the friend and like the deaf wife. Like I think that uh, seems yes. absolutely beautiful. That's the best. But I also just felt like the last half hour, 45 minutes was a bit like contrived for me and kind of like tied a neat bow around the whole thematically in a way that like, I just felt, I don't know, kind of sucked the mystery out of it and, and really kind of felt, I don't know, not satisfying to me, so. <laughs> I had the same response, you know, but I mean, obviously it, it's, it's like look, looking at gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> to use yeah. a and he's clearly an extremely talented and amazing filmmaker and um, a shout out for those who are just coming to Hamaguchi now, we should definitely shout out to Asako one and two, which did not make the top 10 a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Sadly, I think it was hovering really? right under. But it, it, yeah, but it, it was definitely close and happy hour i, I don't think a ton of us saw happy hour at the time but that's also a, a terrific movie yeah that one's five hours for people who think drive my car is too long which it isn't um okay so I, I know that the suspense has already been spoiled there it is well, everybody knew y'all knew everybody knew what else, what else could it have been really uh, before more meaningful commentary, I will say that when Jeff and I talked about this movie, we both were like, God damn, I wish I'd made this movie. Not not that either of us is anywhere near to being able to accomplish that, but it's like the the it's just so perfect. It's just so lovely. Well, and also, I mean, I feel like his movies are they're always really hard to talk about because yeah. so many different kinds of things are happening. They're so slippery. They're so hard to get a handle on. And so it's almost as if he like looked around and said, well, I will, I will make it even more challenging for you by making a movie that is about the impossibility of language to capture existence or to be um, a driving force for obtaining knowledge. And even with that, it's still, I mean, it's maybe the, one of the most pleasurable movie experiences I've had this year just so enjoyable throughout, even as it is questioning our ability to know it in any meaningful way. And then it becomes a sci-fi movie in the last five minutes, which I just think also, if we're talking about great endings of the year, that what happens at the end of this movie is just such a joy that he goes there. Well, or it's been a sci-fi movie all along. We just didn't know it. Sci-fi become real science. Um, I, um, I think, Jeff, not only does it... Um, uh, sort of deal with like the impossibility of language to encompass certain kinds of experiences, but but actually all like categories of communication unto each other. Like she hears this sound and is trying to translate the idea of memory using other sounds that are accessible to her um, with trying to describe it with language. And I think each of those scenes um, are so, um, they resonate so deeply with experiences that we've all had, even if it isn't about something as profound. And I think in some cases, uh, experiences that we've had and struggle even to uh, recall meaningfully, to know that we should discuss it, the things that happen like privately in memory and dreams. Um, and I, I appreciated also the balance of the, these sort of, um, you know, circling, circling around the ineffable with, you know, spiraling out around the very quotidian and the, you know, din dinner with your sister and the visit to the hospital and, um, you know, trying to buy a refrigerator <laughs> for your business. Um, and it sort of like imbues the everyday with magic because of, um, because of the scenes that like touch on something more, um, more indescribable than our day-to-day -day experiences. Is a, it's an extraordinary film. Um, I don't know if anyone else had wanted to say anything about it before we um, move along to some of the some of our favorites that might not have made the list. Um, anyone and anything any, anything about Memoria besides you know, my God, <laughs> what an incredible movie! Thank God this filmmaker exists. I have one thing actually. Uh, you should get this book if you don't have it. The Fireflies Press uh, Memoria yeah. kind of behind the scenes it's great um but yeah what everyone said it's amazing perfect wonderful thing is anybody's number one other than me not on the list oh that's a great question yes yes 
I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't remember if I put that specific movie as number one, so but I'm pretty sure I did. Been? Well, what could it have um, been, or what might it have been? <laughs> Bar- <laughs> Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. <laughs> Eric, I'm just not a list person. I'm not into that, like, you know, file bullshit, so I don't know what my number one was, but there was a lot to love. <laughs> And I, yeah. and, and I will, as I said earlier, I will um, see you. I don't, know if I'll, I don't know if I'll raise you because mine was, it was lower on my list, but I will see you when you say Barb and Star. I, it, that, I felt like that was the first time I'd watched a pure comedy that felt like appropriately anarchic and, you know, yes. does what it wants to do and is really, really funny all the way through in a really long time. It really is. And I understand that like your mileage may vary depending on your sense of humor. I really do. But like, I have I have missed that many jokes flying at me per minute in a like in a feature film for so long and I truly can't remember the last time it happened and I just I really do think Kristen Wiig gives like the best set of performances in like the entirety of last year in that movie but uh, yeah, I love. Appreciated, <laughs> maybe, maybe for me, maybe the funniest comedian of the twenty first. Totally, century. totally, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, wait, wait, now, wait, wait, now, wait. Eric, what was yours? Mine was the viewing booth by um, Renan Alexandrovich. Um, I don't know how many, uh, if, if enough people saw it or if it ranked at all, but that was, you know, um, my it, odd how these things work because it's a film that I saw it you know, the end of 2019 and was supposed to play in 2020, finally came out in 2021. Um, but uh, yeah, no film has stuck with me longer and no film has meant more to my understanding of cinema than that one. Yeah, that I, was- I, I will my, say, sorry, sorry, Jeff. I was just saying that was on my list, on my top 10, not my number one, but- It was on my list too. I think that, and, and it wasn't on a lot of others, but I do think that that had to do with the fact that it didn't get widely seen um or it just might not have been for everybody but i, I do remember um I, I you know there were a couple of lists that didn't come in i'm gonna say from certain writers who i know really love that movie but they never they never turned in their lists so that mm, might have made they, are they here with us now can we call them out no 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 <laughs> <laughs> i'm always uh disappointed when we don't see any docs make the list and i was wondering if, if people would could share some of their favorite nonfiction uh, films from 2021. I'll start. I, I think Ascension is one of the best films of the, of the year. Um, and think that it, yeah, it's, it, it speaks to um, some, it speaks to a moment and a sort of like a uh, shift in global economy in a way that's totally unexpected and, um, and, and ne- I think needs to be seen now. I think it has an urgency. Um, I, I also wanted to, I want to sh- just respond by looking at the, the thread, um, the ch- chat. We have a few people who mentioned North by Current and that I have to say it was very close, mm. the top 10. I think it was number 12, 12 or 13, um, which, you know, again, if more people had seen North by Current and th- there's just a trouble with access with certain films, I think it probably would have made the list. Well, um, if, and I think that films that don't have like traditional distribution are hard in these moments too, because they're it's access, but it's also kind of a confusion over what's eligible. Um, and the viewing booth is in that category too, so it didn't even have a distributor. So it came out and was reviewed, but it didn't have a distributor. So it's hard, I think, for people to know where, where to get it. Yeah. Um, um, I wanted, I wanted with my, oh, sorry, for you. I just wanted to say other docs that came up in the chat are Faya Dai and... Um, what did I just see? All light everywhere. Although uh, I know there's some dissent among the reverse shot team on that. Not, for now. Yeah, some of us are not American fans. Of that one. But um, <laughs> I wanted to say that my number five movie of the year was a doc. It was all about my sisters, um, which is an extraordinary uh, Chinese film. That's it, it. It takes. It seems like it's going to just be not just, but it's going to be like a personal diary film where a young woman has filmed her family over a course of many years, um, but it's actually aesthetically amazing and incredible narrative storytelling and um, just gets at the personal um, toll of the one child policy um, better than anything I've seen. It's an incredible movie. So all about my sisters, which played an anthology. I don't know where it is right now, if it's available. I'm 
convinced that if more people saw that movie, it would be more talked about. Yeah. Mm, I, can I throw out preparations to be together for an unknown period of time, which I think oh, some other folks in yes. here. That's number three. <laughs> that movie is, it, I mean, what is that film? How does it do the things that it does? Because it's, it's totally insane and scary for so long. And you think it's going to be one of these, well, it's kind of, you know, something's wrong with her. She has some sort of a problem, psychological thriller. And then it is, at least for me, and I know there are different ways to read it, it becomes very much not that. And it becomes so wonderful and gorgeous and generous in the last, I would say, like half hour or 20 minutes. It just, it, it just came out of complete nowhere for me. Yeah. 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 Good movie. Oh, it's so great. And also, I will say, I'm not going to say the ending, but I do think the ending and how you read it is a true litmus test for what kind of person you are in a relationship. <laughs> and I will stand by that. What, is, what does it say about me that I think it's so so warm and kind and, and lovely? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, that's questionable. Kind of strange reading. <laughs> for me, like my takeaway was, all right, love is a neurological disorder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, someone just mentioned Benediction. Benediction uh, wasn't on the list. That's coming out next year. Benediction is a Terrence Davies new movie that is great, um, but it's technically getting released next year. So that might um, answer that. Unless you well, I'm going to complicate. I'm going to complicate that statement, Michael, because Days somehow qualified last year and it didn't get theatrical last year. So <laughs> your your rules are a little bit slippery. Well, if we had, we, we couldn't have had days two years in a row as the best movie. No, but you decided to qualify days when oh, it yeah. happened. Yeah, 2020, the world was topsy-turvy. <laughs> Everything's been solved now. Everything's perfect. Everything's been perfect. <laughs> so everything goes back to normal. Don't you know that, Eric? Does, does Petite Mama count for, counts for this year, right? It was all so close. I loved Petite Mama. I loved Petite Mama. And I also think that it, it does not get talked about as much as it should because it's just in a lower register. I think that sometimes, you know, films that, that are more gentle um, from directors who were not always used to seeing that way get a little bit forgotten about, particularly in an environment where we're not able to go to the movies as often. Um, but I really loved Petite Mama. Yeah. I, and I, also, and I think it's great to watch with family. It's also the, the weird thing that happens at the end of the year when all of these really excellent movies are suddenly shoved into these like one week qualifying runs or whatever they're doing now. So you can't tell if it really came out or not, but it counts. That Petite Maman is certainly a casualty of that. I think people will catch up with it and, and, and appreciate it and admire it more. Um, that's just my guess about that movie. It's great. Um, do we want to, I know we're running out of time. Actually, we're out of time. But before we leave, I feel like Maybe we should give a hint of some of our least favorite movies of the year because <laughs> there, there may be more writing <laughs> coming from reverse shot after this on some of those. I can go first if anybody, if anyone's too scared. I'm really, really not a fan of Kenneth Branagh's Belfast. I don't think it's just overrated. I think it's bad. <laughs> I think that there isn't a good thing about it. I nope. hated watching every second of it. I think that it's cloying, poorly directed, and even the black and white looks like shit. So <laughs> that, those are pretty big sins. Also, mm -hmm. um, the way certain scenes are blocked are just baffling. I could kind of like do, I wanna do like a commentary track for Belfast because I could, I hate it so much. How did you feel about the, the in-color tourism video shot by drones that opens the film? With Van Morrison music. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of it. <laughs> like that. <laughs> And you're getting um, some love for your Tick Tick Garbage uh, retitle. Oh, tick Tick Garbage. <laughs> uh, others, uh, others agree with you here. Oh. And there's some uh, net haters in the chat. What? No, those, those people are crazy. No. <laughs> but Tick Tick Boom is truly the worst movie. I like painful to sit through. I, I mean, I also just hate Lemon Manuel Miranda, but like that's a whole different story. But <laughs> like Tick Tick Booms. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> I hadn't watched it because I thought it would merely be mediocre and boring. But if it's hateable, that actually pushes me <laughs> into the zone of like wanting to understand that experience. So maybe yeah, I'll think it's making me want to watch all of these as well. <laughs> yeah. I think the movie that offended me the most was probably Spencer, which I think like, 
expanded my understanding of the ways in which a movie can be bad. Um, <laughs> so I won't get into it now, but it's like offensive and like, silly and and contrived on like a number of ways I, and yet it's made you grow I, as a person and critic it is true <laughs> true it actually like after coming out of it my friend was like you should probably write about it and I was like because you're like you're having a lot of thoughts and feelings like I definitely reacted a lot to it which is I guess is saying something <laughs> I I would say I disliked it greatly I hated uh, Jackie even more. I think Jackie is. Just I don't like Jackie either. So, <laughs> but I will say the only thing that I like more about it is that Jackie has Natalie Portman, uh oh, and Spencer has Kristen Stewart, who I can get, I can, I can get with. I think, she, I think she, I think she elevates it to an interesting place. But I didn't like the movie at all. Yeah, it's weird because in moments when she's silent, I'm really on board with her performance, but whenever she opens her mouth and like says a line of his dialogue, I'm just like, no. <laughs> yeah, the dialogue is rough. Yeah, I, I love her so much. She's sort of unimpeachable, but I kind of cringed through the entire performance. I hate to say that because I love her so much. But, you know, it kind of reminded me of like, uh, like a Harry Potter performance at times. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, Michael, um, thanks for letting us end on a note of hate. Yeah, so nice. <laughs> so nice. Well, we don't have That's to. That's what people that. want from Rush. <laughs> before yeah. we, does anyone else have an offense they wanted to say before we go back to a, to a nice, happy place? No, no, no one. That's good. Everyone's just so positive. Um, we'll save well, it for the pen. Yeah. Yeah. The poison pen. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. We're, he, we're hitting the 75 minute mark. So we're way past the happy hour. Um, but this was, this is the way to do this. I think this was uh, a lot of fun. And I loved hearing everyone, everyone's um, perspectives on what I thought was actually a really good year for movies. So I think we should raise a glass if people still have their- To glasses. a good year for movies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it feels good to be back. <laughs>